Hello, welcome to our webinar on a skills first talent strategy. I'm Abby Lundberg, editor in chief at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be moderating the event. A skills first talent strategy helps companies stay competitive and increases workforce resilience in a world where jobs keep changing and artificial intelligence is having a greater and greater impact on work. In today's webinar, we'll explore why skills first practices matter so much in the age of AI and how to build and measure the success of a skills first talent strategy. To lead us through this, we're delighted to welcome Anish Raman, Vice President and Head of the Opportunity Project at LinkedIn. The Opportunity Project works with leaders across the private and public sectors to build a more transparent, dynamic, and equitable global lab labor market in the age of AI. Elise Rosenblum is the founder and managing director of Grads of Life, a talent strategy consulting firm that works with employers to implement skills first talent practices that deliver both business benefits and social impact. Welcome, Elise and Anish. Thank you uh, so much for having us. Thank you all for joining us, everyone who came here and committed the time to learn about skills first thinking that uh, gives me new levels of hope that a better world of work is coming because the interest we are seeing from both public and private sector institutions around skills first thinking is at a level um, we've never seen before. I think uh, Elise, you would agree that there are two eras to the skills conversation before AI and after AI. And to start us off, I'd love for you with one word or one phrase uh, to describe what you think AI has done. What's the impact that it's made already on this skills first movement? Hmm, one word. I mean, I think the word has to be accelerant. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It is it, underneath that game changing, but it is, uh, and we'll go through all the reasons why, but AI is making skills first um, a prerequisite for anyone who's trying to build a competitive business or career in the age of AI. But we want to start by getting a read of the room. So we've got a poll. Um, and the question is, how is your organization currently thinking about AI and the ways it will impact your approach to talent? You can answer um, with more than one of these options, but I wanna try and push the room to not just answer if you are thinking about it as an individual, but if you're at an organization where the idea has started to get implemented, doesn't have to be in systems, but at least in, in cross team conversations or a team conversation, where is that happening across these options? And then we will have the results um, in a few seconds once we get them, but this is uh, early days in a big paradigm shift. So. I'm quite excited actually to see where people are are landing. Um, I'm just looking at the real results as they're coming in. Uh, this this feels like it's intuitive to how we're seeing the story really build. And, and Skills First really, I think went first mainstream. I mean, it's been around, at least can attest to it because she's been in this world for, for years um, during the pandemic and the global conversations around equity that we saw and a desire to find more ways to bring more diverse talent into the workforce. And so it's intuitive to me that that um, is up there at the top. And then we've got internal mobility, upskill our teams, what AI is going to do to certain roles. And this, it's so interesting. I mean, Elise, you're probably feeling the same thing. It makes complete sense. And it's encouraging that people are moving on the things that are the immediate opportunities for AI, opening up talent pools, internal mobility, um, and upskilling. And then you're already starting to see what I would say is quite strategic thinking for these early days, which is thinking about how AI tools are going to change team dynamics and the blurred lines that are going to exist between functions. And then the really powerful part to me, what AI is going to free up people to do. Um, so with that, I thought, you know, from where we sit at LinkedIn, we have this sort of really broad global view um, of the labor market. And so I wanted to start give, by giving everyone what we're seeing at sort of the 30,000 foot level. Um, and, and the first thing I'd say is that AI is a big deal. It is ushering in a new world of work. You might remember when uh, November chat GPT brought AI mainstream sort of between then and I'd say the spring or at least into early this year, there was a big question, is this just hype? Is this real? Uh, and that was appropriate and there were a, a lot of conversations around it, but I think we're now all aware this is a big deal and it's gonna change all of work. But second, um, it is going to impact different sectors and different functions in different ways over different timeframes. All of us on this call are going to feel the impacts of AI differently. 
It's not like the pandemic when we all went to remote work all at once. So third, that's a really hard thing to get your head around, a game changing thing in the world of work that's going to impact everyone differently. And Elise and I would argue that the only way, not just the best way, the only way to approach that kind of change is with a skills first mindset. It's as easy as starting to look at your job and realizing the new digital skills or AI related skills. What AI tools are you using? Are you prompting? And the new durable skills are increasingly going to be what we call soft skills, but really are people skills, the stuff that we as humans uniquely can do. What that's going to mean fourth is we're going to have to fundamentally change how we build careers and companies, new playbooks across it all, new playbooks on workforce development, how we hire differently, develop talent differently, but also technological development, how we bring greater intent and responsibility to the building of AI. But fifth, at the other end of this, and I think this is imminently possible if we get the intent right and the playbooks right, at the other end of this is a world of work that is more human, not less. A world of work where people skills are core to, uh, comp to career success and people to people collaboration are core to company success. The big idea I've been thinking about for us as a species is what's coming is a world of work where EQ is at the center of success, not IQ, or at least not IQ alone. We've never seen that as a species. And I think AI is going to push us into this new realm. So that's kind of the high level view. Um, in terms of the today view, some data from what we're seeing on LinkedIn. Uh, first, this is a real conversation underway. We've seen a 21x increase in job postings that have some mention of chat GPT or GAI related terms, 109% increase in demand for AI engineers over the past three months, nearly a 3x increase in the head of AI positions at companies. Uh, over the past five years. So rate of growth is shooting up for AI related skills and jobs. What's interesting though, is that those roles are still just 1% of talent on LinkedIn. So you get both the swiftness of change that's coming, but really we are in the early days. Uh, on the skill side, you're seeing a 75% increase each month since January in LinkedIn members who are adding GAI related terms to their profile. And people are starting to realize Lifelong learning is now becoming a must do, at least career long learning. And you're seeing a 65% uptick in time learning on our top AI courses. Um, so you can sort of feel the energy I have here, at least in our prep. This is the moment you said, I've got a question uh, and I feel like other people in the room might have it too. So I'll let you ask it uh, for everyone and on everyone's behalf. Yeah, I mean, I love, first of all, I love, I love how much real time data you guys have at LinkedIn. And I think my question is, I mean, you are such a bullish optimist on all of this and um, it's exciting to feel your optimism. So, you know, love to hear a little bit more about that. And also like, what are the watch outs that you're thinking about? Yeah, I am. Um, so I'm constitutionally optimistic. So you <laughs> should all uh, discount my optimism generally, but not here because I really feel here. I am a credible optimist, a rational optimist. Um, the first reason is that the status quo is not worth preserving. Uh, I think the labor market has never done a good job of transparently or equitably or dynamically matching talent and opportunity. Lots of reasons why, but if you believe that, then we're at least at a moment where we can make bad better. So that's like the first cause uh, of optimism. The second cause is we've been going through this change for some time. So we have this data point at LinkedIn that shows your job is changing on you your workforce is changing on you, even if you are not changing your job or adjusting your workforce development strategies. Um, the skills needed for jobs have changed by about 25% since 2015. With AI accelerating that change, we estimate it'll be about 65% by 2030. That means you, you have a new job, even if you don't change your job. You have a new workforce, even if you don't change your workforce. And so that gives me optimism because the momentum for change on a broken status quo um, is really clear right now. Uh, the other thing I would say is what I'm seeing on LinkedIn itself. Um, in moments of great big disruption, um, they've generally been opaque to everyone who isn't actually building the technology that is disrupting things. And so everyone outside of that small group generally the most privileged people in the labor market, didn't know what was happening, didn't have a voice to shape it, and didn't really feel the impacts until it was decided for them by those who were in the room. Things are very different right now, and I think LinkedIn is part of why. There is radical transparency happening around what's coming from AI. On LinkedIn itself, 
We have this new thing we um, launched called Collaborative Articles. Think of it as Wikipedia for professionals written by and edited by professionals in real time. That is now available for anyone and everyone to track all the conversations that are happening around AI. By the way, we've also seen LinkedIn as the world's largest professional network rally behind the intent part of AI. Um, responsible AI conversations are up 7x year over year. So the knowledge sharing, I think, is one area of optimism that's credible off LinkedIn. The skills part is the other. Uh, members are adding 500 million skills a year, at least uh, in the last year. Why that's important, I think those of us on the call know that more skills taxonomies aren't always better and more skills listings aren't always better. But on a member profile, what's important is members are contextualizing their skills. So skills are foundational to how we match talent and opportunity. Above that, you need to contextualize and credential those skills. On the LinkedIn member profile, you could say, oh, I'm good at communication. I'm good at strategic planning. Okay, show me what job that means you think that, and what did you do in that job? So starting to build this contextualizing muscle. We're starting to see degrees um, become less necessary. One in five job descriptions on LinkedIn now don't require a degree. That doesn't mean degrees are bad. It doesn't mean that degrees go away. It means when you think about skills and above it, contextualizing and credentialing, degrees are now not the only way forward for people, which I know at least you'll talk about too, is incredibly equalizing. 50% uh, of hirers are using skills explicitly now when looking at candidates and increasingly employers are realizing all the hard stuff that stalled out skills. How do we build a taxonomy? How do we make it dynamic? How do I make it a filter as easy to click as degrees? AI is going to help with that. AI is both an accelerant, as we talked about, for skills first, but it's going to be a tool to build these new systems. Um, so that's the optimism I'm feeling. And then I would just end with kind of beyond what we spoke of, Gen Z. I mean, we have this other force besides AI that is changing expectations around work that I think also argue why skills first is going to go more to the center. People looking beyond pay and pensions to career mobility and transferability of skills across jobs. Um, that's going to make it even more critical. So that's kind of my pitch. I mean, Elise, I'm curious because you're in the room with employers. You're working with them on the nuts and bolts of system building. Uh, what have I said uh, would be credible and what would they be like, you're, you're, uh, you lost me? Yeah, I mean, I think the pace of change is just inviting people into this transformation um, in a, you know, like in a totally frontal way. I mean, employers are living the reality of labor shortages. Like you cannot, you actually cannot build your business doing things the way you've always done it. We've got to find ways to invite people off the sidelines and stepping into a skills first strategy is a really powerful way to do that. And I think employers are, you know, rolling up their sleeves and embracing that change, um, which is exciting to see. It is, you know, it's change, so it's work, but I think people understand it's work worth doing. Um, and so that's exciting. It's exciting to see. Um, so I'm happy to kind of now pivot and talk a little bit about, um, you know, just a little bit more concretely you know, what does it mean to step into the skills first transformation? And, you know, every time I'm on the phone with Anish, I get excited about all the change that's happening. And, you know, we're all living through change, changes in how we work, where we work. And I think one of the critical changes we think about all the time at Grads of Life is who gets to be at the table? You know, who really has access to a good job? And, um, yeah, you know, the employers that we're working with, and I think the broader skills movement, you know, is demonstrating that in order to manage um, it's such a rapidly changing world of work, you've got to have agility at the center. And a skills first strategy is a powerful vehicle um, to to build a more agile future for your for your workforce. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, the nuts and bolts of skills first strategy. But before we do, um, I want to just get a little bit of sense of for the people in the room, how are you thinking about your skills first best practices? So we've got another poll up and, you know, want to hear from you, which of these skills first best practices has your organization implemented? And just like the prior poll, we want you to select all that apply. Um, so that we can see, you know, where folks are. 
at least I'm curious as, oh, there we go. No, go for it. I was going to ask you, um, even just a few years ago, how many of these things were in conversation or how recent these practices even are? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, you know, emerging and it's really great to see that the, the top area um, that we're hearing from people is they think about their skills first practices as a way to build diverse talent pipelines. Um, and, and that is absolutely on point. You know, if you require a four year degree for a role, you're automatically excluding huge chunks of the population in this country, period. And then you're excluding even larger numbers of people of color. So really thinking about your skills first practices tied to your diversity strategies is you know, smart business. Um, also great to see that people are thinking about skills first practices in the vein of retention and advancement. So things like upskilling and reskilling, which I see a lot of folks on the call are focused on, mentoring and sponsorship and career pathways, really powerful way to leverage a skills first mindset to retain and grow your own workforce. Um, so it's just tremendous to see this is a this is a pretty sophisticated group we have on the phone, no big surprise. Um, so let's go to the next slide here. Um, so when at Grads of Life, our mission is to close the opportunity divide in the country. And that is really all about working with employers to help them get more sophisticated about how to leverage a skills first talent strategy to invite people in off the sidelines. Um, and, you know, there's not any single practice that is you know, the one size fits all kind of silver bullet. What we see is that there's a complement of practices that really span the whole, um, you know, employee life cycle. So you want to think closely, carefully about, you know, how you find and source your talent. That's kind of the first step. Removing a four-year degree, as we just talked about, is a critical element. But if you do that, only in and of itself, you're probably not going to see dramatically different results. To find different talent, you got to start to look different places. You can't just go to the same small number of four-year institutions and expect just because you've removed a four-year degree, you're going to get different results. So you want to think about you know, how do I work with community colleges? How do I work with community-based organizations that provide great workforce training? And also thinking about how you yourself as an employer can create work-based experiences for people to help them build skills. So things like apprenticeships and internships. I, we're seeing a big uptake um, with employers focusing on apprenticeships. So companies like Accenture and Cisco and many others are building apprenticeship into their core model in order to be partners and really building skills to grow their talent pipeline. Then once you've thought about, you know, where do I find talent and how do I be part of the skill building? Um, you want to think about, you know, how do I change my hiring processes? So, you know, okay, I've removed a four-year degree. What else needs to happen? How do I mitigate bias throughout that hiring process? So, you know, building interview rubrics, training your hiring managers, really being thoughtful about um, not just changing a practice, but really training your hiring managers so that they step into the skills first work with you. And, um, you know, companies like United Airlines, like Eli Lilly are really focusing on this, on this part of the pipeline and thinking about, you know, doing a great job of training those hiring managers and other managers so that they have the skills to support a new kind of workforce. Um, and then finally, and many people on the phone are thinking about this, which is really exciting to me, thinking about a skills first approach to retention and advancement. Um, you know, I would say the early days of the skills first movement, all of the talk was about skills first hiring or skills based hiring. And, you know, I think that's critical. And for many companies, that is the place to focus. But for many employers in this country, you know, we already have large entry level workforces. We have people who might be, you know, kind of stuck in an entry level role. 
thinking about that population of your workforce and putting a skills first mindset there is an incredibly powerful opportunity. How do I build internal mobility pathways for my frontline workforce? You know, these are people who already know your culture. They already have a degree of loyalty. And if you give them opportunities to grow, to build their skills and advance, you know, that, that loyalty just increases exponentially. So I'm really excited about the retention and advancement um, focus within the skills first movement. Um, you know, companies like Delta Airlines, like Merck, they're thinking really broadly about a skills first transformation. Um, Walmart's another company, you know, they just announced they were moving four year degrees for a huge number of corporate roles. Big opportunity for people that are working for Walmart, the largest employer in the company, in the country, you know, upward mobility is a powerful, powerful opportunity in the skills first space. Um, so I'm really excited and, you know, encourage folks to think broadly about your opportunities um, because everyone can step into the skills first movement, depending on what your business needs are um, and, and, you know, where you're looking to make a difference. Elise, I just wanted to, uh, if we can go back to that slide real quick, sure. one thing that I have found so powerful about what you all have been doing with this slide specifically is that everyone on this call has probably been in conversations about skills that are on an island, that are about one of these circles, unconnected to the others and unconnected to the real business competitiveness argument that is every organization needs to build that agility in. And I think it's been leaders like at least you and you're up um, who have really pushed employers to realize this isn't a specific solve for a specific thing. This is now something much bigger. And I'd encourage everyone on the call, it, once that clicked for me, it changed everything. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that call out, Anish. And, you know, the way we approach it at Grads of Life is we've actually built um, essentially an analytical tool that helps companies understand this is the full set of best practices. And then it's almost like a diagnostic tool. You really get us, you answer a bunch of questions and we're able to tell you, here's what you're, you know, here's what you're doing, here's what you're not doing, and here's your maturity level. And that's been a really powerful way for companies to essentially build a roadmap of action on how they want to navigate their skills first transformation. Um, the companies that have stepped into this work are seeing powerful results. And I think that's that's important because this is an emerging you know, way of thinking. And so, you know, just want to share it's working for the companies that are doing this. They are seeing results. So, um, you know, these are a couple of examples. We have had the privilege to work for the last couple of years with the 110 Coalition, which is you know, more than about 60 large employers. And 110 has been a powerful partner in accelerating the skills first transformation in this country. All of the employers I just mentioned are members of 110. And so they're really helping their member companies understand that whole transformational journey, um, which is really exciting to see. You know, thinking about company, we had the opportunity to work with Cleveland Clinic, which wanted to take a broad look at removing their four-year degrees. And they have opened up an enormous number of roles. And I think what's exciting for Cleveland Clinic, they're the largest employer in Cleveland. They're actually the largest employer in the state of Ohio. And they've always thought about how do we do a better job of hiring, you know, from our home market in Cleveland. There are a lot of people in Cleveland that have historically kind of been stuck on the sidelines, not a lot of, you know, not access to the great jobs with a lot of upward mobility. Um, and with Cleveland Clinic, we're moving four-year degrees in so many roles. Suddenly, they're able to actually partner with folks in the local community in Cleveland and create robust access to opportunity in that market. So that is, you know, that's, that's a tremendous shift for Cleveland Clinic. Lots of opportunity for other large hospital systems to do similar kind of work. We know healthcare is a you know growing sector, um, so big opportunity there. And then I think the other point is this is not just for large large employers. We've had the opportunity to do some work over the last few years um, in the private equity space with you know smaller companies, um, companies like Great Wolf Lodge, where we use some of the assessment tools I mentioned to help them build a roadmap of action, which included identifying roles where they could remove four-year degrees. For them, this was very tightly tied to their DEI goals, and they've seen 
you know, real results, diversifying their workforce, building some internal mobility. So, you know, this is possible. And I would say, again, no matter how big or small you are, um, the, the, point here is to really think about what are my business problems? What what are the things I'm trying to get after? Um, and then there are skills first practices that can help you move the needle on, on those challenges. I think, you know, the last thing that is really critical, and I would say it's the kind of the cutting edge of the skills first movement, is really thinking about how you know if this work is making a difference for you inside your organization. Um, you know, at Grads of Life, we've been thinking, I mean, we've been focused on developing and supporting a skills first movement for probably about a decade. Um, and it's really exciting to see how many companies are stepping into this work. But, you know, what I would say is still emerging is consistent, disciplined, rigorous practice measuring the so what. Okay, I removed four-year degrees. What happened? Did I actually hire more people without four-year degrees or not? Um, so we worked over the last year or two to build a new tool that will help companies get after this important question. Um, we partnered with the Business Roundtable and at several of their companies to just co-create essentially this impact measurement framework, which is meant to help companies really think about, you know, what practices have I changed in the first instance? Then what is the impact on my business bottom line from changing those practices? Again, just going to the easy one of removing four-year degrees or, you know, take another one, training my hiring managers. Okay, I've changed the practice. Then we've identified a whole set of metrics that you would want to be looking at. If I train my hiring managers, what happens to retention? Am I moving the needle on that? We all know retention, you know, is has a big impact on your business bottom line. So I remove, I, I um, remove the four-year degree. Have I actually hired more people without four-year degrees? What's happened to my time to hire? Things like that. Um, and then, you know, the, the long-term question, which I think we're just starting to get after, and I know Anish and I are both excited to kind of dig in on this one in the coming year, along with business impact, is what's the social impact? I mean, again, you know, at Grads of Life, we're all about closing the opportunity divide in the country. We're a nonprofit with a mission. So ultimately, what we're wondering and what we're eager to help companies track and then work with them to kind of get out into the broader conversation is what's the business benefit of adopting these inclusive practices and what's the social impact? Are we moving the needle in closing the opportunity divide? Are more people coming in off the sidelines and getting access to growth opportunities in your organization? So absolutely invite folks, you know, to really get on the cutting edge. Um, we'd be happy to think with you about, you know, which KPIs are going to be critical for you. Um, this impact measurement framework is going to be available in the materials you'll get after the webinar. It's got a lot of information about which metrics to focus on and then even which data to go look for. So big, big resource to help you on your journey. Elise, um, I just want to underscore your point there on four, because I think, um, you know, those of us who have seen the world of work change in the internet age, so over the past few decades, um, one of the ways we've seen that change work is it's really moved the hard technical skills to the center of company planning. And it's meant the tech folks have really been driving a lot of growth for the business, but also decision making. I think AI means that all of you on this call, all the talent professionals are about to take the driver's seat now, because how you figure out the talent side to the tech tools you bring in from AI is the next era of complicated questions for businesses that CEOs are going to have to wrestle with. And so in the way that the CEO is really looking at the CTO um, so often over the past few decades, it's now going to be the CHRO or the chief people officer. And I think at a societal level, what's inspiring about that for all of you is that through you and how you're able to affect employer behavior change, we can build a meritocracy, a global meritocracy in our time. The labor market has always been opaque, and that's made it tremendously unequal and not dynamic. Um, and part of that is it's all been guesswork. Are you the right person? Are you the right? Um, are you getting the right salary? Are you able to shift into this role? 
all of that is guesswork. And all of you have had to really get good at the guesswork because you didn't have an objective data set underneath the people management to start thinking in a methodical way about those questions. You now do with skills. And as you build and bake skills into the systems of employment, that suddenly makes it possible for anyone from anywhere to finally be and do anything. And I think that's a societal impact that we're really looking at if we can organize within the private sector and empower all of you talent professionals to have the objective data set and then to build the right frameworks for the rest of your business to come along this journey. Yeah. And I mean, I appreciate, I really appreciate those comments. That is what makes me so optimistic right now is I think the skills first transformation is the way to really bring equity into the center of talent management. And it's exciting. And, you know, I, I think that it's empowering for talent professionals and it's empowering for, you know, folks that have historically been left on the sidelines and they understand it's all about skills and are highly motivated to kind of understand what skills they have, what skills they need and be partners with you in navigating that journey. So it's a really exciting time. Um, and, you know, just want to thank um, both you, Anish, for your partnership in this work and also Abby and the, and the team at MIT for bringing us together for this conversation. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, really, you teed up so many good questions from the audience. So we'll jump right into those. Um, <clears throat> Anish, I think this, this first question is really for you. Um, it's from Juicily who asks, um, they say the value is clear from DEI and matching talent to opportunity when it comes to skills based, but can you talk a little bit more about how AI comes into the equation? What is the link there? I think AI uh, comes in in two ways. So first, if you, if you get the value of skills at all for any sort of use case, um, you also understand the difficulties of skills, which is how do I credibly um, credential skills in the way that we've all allowed degrees to be a credible credential. So the first thing to realize is, and, and that stalled a lot of people out for a long time, that's about to change very quickly. Um, AI-backed HR tech is about to make skills taxonomies that are dynamic much more possible, much more quickly than ever before. So the first impact of AI is probably its biggest, which has been chipping away at the things that have, have made building the skills first system uh, possible. The second thing I would say that AI does is it fundamentally um, challenges every CEO to rethink everything about their talent playbook. So again, going to that slide Elise has as a spectrum, across it all is just how do I manage the talent part of AI? I get the tech part is gonna be this big deal because AI tools are gonna come in uh, that are gonna help my business grow in new ways. But those tools are really expensive. How do I know which are the right ones? And when I bring them in, how do I manage the people part around that? We have uh, already examples, including LinkedIn with customer service, where we brought in an AI tool, upskilled the team we had, and actually increased um, the team size. So, so this idea that like the answer is going to be AI tool comes in and then you need less workers, that's already being disproven. And so the smart folks are going to get really good at how do you manage the talent part and this is where AI becomes a real accelerant, which is, you know, the old business cycles um, were boom bust. They didn't happen right against each other. There was sort of like a slow process across them. And most companies, to be honest, hired in the booms and fired in the bus. And once they started hiring again after a bus, they copy and pasted a job description from the last boom. And they used that to go get the next sales rep uh, level three, who was going to work their way up to sales rep level four to then eventually become a manager and get their boss's job. None of that's going to work right now because AI is going to fundamentally change what we all do across functions and in our jobs. So the cost of laying someone off is actually quite high because bringing someone new in who has a the cultural understanding that at least talked about is one of the benefits of retention. But B, you're bringing someone into a map that you're still figuring out about where you need new skills. So your ability to actually move people around to think about your workforce as agile, to think about upskilling and tours of duty and skills transferability. Uh, one area where you don't need people anymore means there's another area where you do. How do you move recruiters into sales or salespeople into data analytics? Um, I think it's AT&T that has the best story of the internet age where they literally moved a whole team of marketers into data science to get them equipped for this new uh, need that they had, but with people who had the culture down and who were invested in that growth. 
So AI accelerant on the systems build, but no matter what is the one thing you're excited about Salesforce for, AI is going to make it necessary for everything. Uh, but at least anything you want to add or edit there? No, I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, the thing that has really been a blocker in the skills first talent transformation for so many employers is if I'm not using a college credential as the way to sift and sort who's qualified, what do I use? How do I know what skills people have? And I do think you know, built properly so that it doesn't build in bias, AI is is the going to be the answer to that. It will be the validator of what skills I have. Um, and, and that will be a huge unlock. There are a couple of questions that have to do with sort of how do we transition from the way skills and talents and roles have been managed in the past to this approach. Um, in particular, how do you see these shifts improving opportunity? I'm oh, sorry, wrong question. Um, it's multiple skill sets applicable to each role. How do you identify and prioritize most skills? To, do competency yeah. frameworks have a role here? Yeah, well, I think before you get there, what we've been advising everyone to do, and you could do this at an individual level, a team level, a workforce at level. Before you get to skills, think about your jobs, not as job titles, but as job tasks. So, you know, Abby, in your job, what are the dozen tasks you do every day? What are the review things you do, the leadership things you do? What are those tasks? Now, once you have those tasks, what are the tasks that AI is already really equipped to do basically all of? Summarizing meaning notes, doing a first look at a budget doc for errors. So put those tasks in there. In the middle are tasks that you're going to do with AI. I write a lot in my job and I use ChatGPT a lot to help me refine my writing, to push me on my thinking. I'm getting really good at prompting ChatGPT on writing prompts. So that's bucket two. And then bucket three is what are the tasks that you are uniquely doing as a human? And we're all human. So we all have human skills. What are the collaboration tasks, the empathy tasks, the sort of culture building or leadership tasks? And once you do that mapping, you can start to see, okay, I might be heavy in bucket one. I need to start upskilling on bucket two and really think about bucket three. Or if you're a nurse, you're really heavy on bucket three. You've got a really durable job right now. Um, but even in that bucket three, what it means to be a manager is going to change. You're not going to just check in on what people are doing with their work because we're going to start to have these platforms that can do that more easily. You're going to have to be more coach. You're going to have to be more mentor. You're going to have to have more empathy and more EQ. So it's going to shift in that way. And so I think the easiest way to start is to start with tasks. And then with that mapping of tasks, start to bring skills as your way to understand what to do. But anyone that is is wed to job titles is going to have a hard time because those are going to tell you less and less. So it's not just degrees that are going to tell you less and less of someone's aptitude because the shelf life of a degree is, is shrinking dramatically. But even a past job experience based on a job title at a big name employer is going to tell you less and less. So tasks and then with the tasks, you can bring the skills in. Yeah. And the only other thing I would add, which I think is consistent with everything Anish just said, is, you know, I think this this can feel overwhelming. It's a massive change. And so what we've seen um, to be most effective for most organizations is to start, you know, in a function or to start you know, with a set of um, with a set of roles, not to say you know, you're not talking about job titles, but you want to start in a discrete area that you can like chunk off, roll up your sleeves and dig in and then begin to build the muscle around how do we think differently? How do we change our processes um, and get get some reps on that and some success under your belt? Because a big part of I think what is is hard for people to wrap their heads around is you know, there's a lot of risk aversion in in this area, and so you know starting relatively discreetly, um, building some new processes, getting some success under your belt can be a really powerful way to then um, be able to change mindsets with your peers in your organization and and really then take the work to scale. Few organizations, I think, take a wholesale approach of like, we're going to redo everything now across our entire organization. Um, so that, that's the only other thing I would add. Yeah. So a, a, a couple of questions that have to do with sort of the internal impact of making the shift. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, the first one is, 
you know, it, it's clear to see from sort of a, a talent strategy perspective, all these different things that you can do. But as we know, you know, it's really the frontline managers and supervisors who are who are responsible for a lot of these things. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, given given that sort of you know, employee journey, so you're starting with recruiting and hiring and then development, um, where do you see the biggest impact on frontline managers and what do they need to know and do differently to be able to be successful here? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, frontline managers sort of, it all begins and ends there, it, you know, at the end of the day. So we have seen, um, you know, it's really important to kind of, you know, as talent leaders, work with your teams to lay out, you know, a, a redesign process, essentially. Um, you know, we often work with companies to redesign that process. And then we go in and we train those frontline managers, because again, this all can fall apart if they feel there's too much risk in what they're being asked to do. You know, they've got budget, they've got a role, they've got to make the hiring decision. And if you ask them to do it in a pretty different way, their goal, it's, it's just human nature. They're going to be worried about whether they're going to make a good decision or not. I mean, one really interesting thing that some companies have done, and this is, this is by not at all the norm, but it's a very powerful way to get your skills first work going, is actually to have centralized budget for the first year to support those frontline managers, essentially you're de-risking the decision-making and you're allowing them to use a different process in finding and hiring talent and onboarding the talent. And then a year in, you know, they, then, then if the person has been successful, they own the budget going forward. But, you know, for companies that can pull that off, it works really well. It, you know, you're de-risking something that is, a real risk. So I would say if you can pull off centralized budget to enable managers to sort of put risk to the side, I mean, that's a huge opportunity. But for those that can't, and that's most, train those managers, you know, invest in training them because you are asking them to do something differently. And I think the third thing I would say is, um, you know, you can change your practices and you can provide training, but you really need to be thinking about how you invite them into changing their mindsets. You know, they need to understand why, you know, if you're, if this is coming down from the C-suite, why are we doing this? Why is this important to the values of our company? Because I think, you know, ultimately bringing people along in the mindset shift and, and getting your managers bought into you know, a skills first talent strategy is one that is going to fuel our business and it's aligned to our values because we're going to be, you know, increasing access to opportunity, build, making our communities stronger. Um, so those would be the three things I would. I yeah, would I, just to underscore that third one, because I think in the early days of a big shift like this, um, in so many ways, the story matters most because whatever is happening with AI is, a, is just it's this thing that's occurring and we're all interpreting it largely with predictions and with assumptions and with anxiety and uncertainty and creating a story. And once the story gets set in our heads, it reinforces how we respond to that event. So at a societal level, I think if we allow fear to pervade, it makes much less likely all the good that we hope can come. But if we allow credible optimism to pervade, it incentivizes people to start thinking differently and to work together to make better, more possible. And I think hiring managers are a great example of where that work needs to happen. Um, the story I would tell your hiring managers right now is that the riskiest thing is to be risk averse because they either can do the hard work now and get ahead of this change and they and their team will benefit from it, or it's going to come hit them later when it gets even more difficult to try and get their head around. And one practical example is I don't care what job title you're looking for. I think we all recognize that growth mindset, ability to learn, ability to handle hard well. What are the core skills that any individual needs to help a company manage a moment like this? And how are they thinking about that? How do they ask for that? Oh, great. Well, that's basically how we're talking about a skills first mindset. And as you think about your team, what do you think your team is going to be doing differently in two to four years? They're probably going to say, I don't really know yet. And that's going to be great for you because you say, well, then that means you shouldn't just hire someone who's done a job at a place around a static way of work that's no longer going to be true. Let's think about what are the sort of skill sets you think you're going to need more of, and let's start to plan how we're going to build a pipeline around it. 
So one of the things that's been really helpful about AI for skills is now the answer to something. I think before AI, skills was just this thing unto itself that for good moral reasons, we were out there advocating for it. But a lot of hiring managers and businesses didn't get what it was solving at a systems level. They got it at DEI, they got it in terms of hiring. AI is now the thing skills is solving and everyone's thinking about and feeling AI. So story matters most and really build one with hiring managers that help them understand the today impact of this thinking, even in their own job as a team leader. Yeah, and, and I, I would imagine that the story is really important for existing employees as well as you start going into this journey. Anna asked the question, do you observe internal resistance against skills first approaches by colleagues with a degree and perhaps sense of entitlement and now being challenged by skilled but no degree candidates for promotion? Any examples to share and recommendations about how to tackle this? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, one of my earlier jobs was at an ed tech startup, and I dealt with a lot of what I would call unfounded um, elitism about why everyone had to have the right degree. Um, and also unfounded elitism about how vocational training shouldn't be part of like education at a higher level. Um, the people who are going to be worst off, I think, in the age of AI are people who um, whose mediocrity has not been clear because of how they've been able to rise up. And we know the degree biases systems um, in a lot of ways that aren't about potential or aptitude. It blocks people out with those and are about who do you know and do you just have the least risky profile for me to hire? Um, but skills is not an anti-degree endeavor. And I think that's really important with the story. And we had to do this even within our storytelling. Skills is um, cause for people to have more than just the degree as a way to understand someone's potential. Mm -hmm. Skills are beneath contextualizing and credentialing skills. Degrees will remain a dominant and they are the incumbent way that we credential skills. Um, and I think that's really important because then it doesn't suggest that degrees don't matter. And then it also calls out why do degrees matter? The networks that colleges provide. Okay, how can we do that elsewhere while acknowledging it there? And I think this big push I'm talking about with EQ Humanities degrees are going to uh, start to matter. You know what is probably one of the most enduring and durable degrees, no matter how long ago you got it right now? Ethics and philosophy, because what you learn is applicable right now versus a hard technical degree like computer science that's getting upended by what's happening with AI and coding. So there are certain parts to a college degree that will matter, and that makes college access really important. But we have to start broadening it out. So for those who are facing that resistance, A, don't challenge it as the thing you're trying to take down because that's not true and also it entrenches people in their view. Help people understand their values to degrees but also other ways we need people in. And then I think third, the most credible argument is one and done learning is done. The idea that you get a degree and five or 10 years out, that degree is gonna be the majority of how you do your job is intuitively off to people. Uh, Elise and I, when we do meetings, we often ask people, raise your hand if the majority of what you do is based on the degree you had. It's usually zero to none. Now we're not talking to doctors or you know lawyers where there's a professional degree that's necessary. Raise your hand if more than half of what you do is based on things you're doing in your job now or across your work experience. And like almost every hand goes up. You're a skills-based hire. You're a skills first person. And so I think that's part of how we chip away at it. Yeah, I mean, I would I would just add that, you know, I think that this is a real thing for people who are in the workforce who, you know, obtained a degree and now they're looking around and saying, like, what is this skill? What do you mean skills based and what about me? And so I think there's, you know, I agree with everything Anish said. And then I think, you know, a narrative around skills first being for everyone is is a, is important to get into the into the conversation in your organization. And it's actually why I'm excited about the focus on upward mobility, because whether, you know, if you, if you go through a skills first transformation and skills becomes the way you manage performance and think about advancement, you know, that's open to everyone. So, you know, whether I have a BA or I don't have a BA, you know, now my promotion opportunities are really framed around skills. What skills have I mastered? You know, where can I move inside my organization or into another organization? So, you know, I think you, you can't really put your head in the sand and say that that, you know, people aren't going to have some feelings about why did I work so hard to get my degree and now I don't need it. I think 
um, you have to manage that, you have to acknowledge it, and you have to really pivot to a skills first transformation so that people can begin to see, hey, this benefits me too. And then, you know, I think then just continuing to work on that mindset thing, like no one is saying a degree isn't important or valuable. I think the point here is it shouldn't be the only door you can walk in to move into a company and achieve upward mobility. Great. Um, there's a question here about uh, the, how skills first affects culture or how you build culture when you're taking this approach. So George asks, how do you create an objective data set of skills to measure a candidate's fit for the culture? Or is that even a goal? But, you know, how do you think about especially as you're talking about with EQ becoming so much more important for, for uh, people as AI takes on more of the IQ piece. Um, what is that link between, or how do you ensure and build a, a good culture? Uh, well, uh, what excites me about that is that we're about to figure out. And by that, I mean, if you think about what the internet economy did, it forced us to get really good at a scalable level at credentialing and training around hard technical skills, coding boot camps data science, like we figured all of it out. We figured out how to teach it, how to train it, how to assess it, how to hire for it, how to promote around it. We have never as a species done that sort of thing around EQ soft skill stuff. We've never done a boot camp for empathy and figured out how to teach it, how to train it, how to credential it, how to upskill it for collaboration, for culture. Um, now there are a lot of ways that bias could play into this, which we all know, which is why the intent on the AI build is so key. Um, but we're, this is the new frontier that AI is pushing us as humans into, which is how do we start organizing really for the first time ever at scale around the social skills, around the EQ stuff, around the stuff that makes us uniquely human. So it's one of those where I am like happy to concede we're not there yet. We're just starting. But man, am I bullish on the fact that we're heading in that direction and that there's energy building on that being the thing to solve, um, that it's going to start happening much more quickly than we saw the boot camps around coding and data science emerge. Yeah, I think the other dimension to, to George's very good question is um, you've got to you've got to actually take a change management approach to your skills first transformation. And um, just like any other change you'd roll across your company you need to be really disciplined about a change management um, approach to socializing skills first, building it into your culture, measuring it, having your leadership talk about it. So, you know, that would just be the other dimension. But Anisha's absolutely right. You know, George put his finger on kind of the big, the big horizon ahead of us. We've got a couple of questions having to do with um formal education. And so uh, one of them is, <clears throat> will there still be value for higher education programs and partnerships in this new skills first work environment? I know you've, you've said that, you know, degrees are still important and fine. Um, but then also, uh, that was from Barbara, Viviana sa asks, says universities are facing a Kodak moment if they are not transforming core curriculum at the required speed or research or e-skilling their own staff and educators. How do you see the current talent gap being addressed for this transition? I mean, I think we are in a transformational moment in higher education, absolutely. I mean, and I, I don't hold myself out as an expert on the higher ed transformation, but I think, um, you know, employers are looking to partner in new and different ways with educational institutions. And um, those that I think are able to be more nimble are gonna get further in, you know, being part of the solutions that, you know, we've just been talking about that are still yet to be built. Um, I mean, I again, this is not my area of expertise narrowly. I don't see, I think higher education is always gonna have a critical role in preparing people um, for you know whatever comes next in their in their lives, and you know it's going through as much, if not more, transformation than we're seeing in the world of work right now. Yeah, I, and, and especially based on the time I spent at the ed tech startup, like I think you know if you think about what higher ed has meant in terms of economic mobility, 
Um, most of the history of your work, you inherited work from your parents. So that's not equal, nor is it efficient. And it's just been a couple hundred years um, since the steam engine where we've had these industrial revolutions create new ways of work. And over time, we said, okay, higher ed, you be the gateway to mobility. Anyone who gets in there should be set up to do anything. And that's come on, it, you know, it served its purpose, I would say, not in a truly equal way um, in terms of communities of color, but it did do work around that sort of mobilization. What happened is some pressure started to build in the US. The cost of college started to go up so high that people were wondering, well, is that cost worth it against what I'm gonna get? Um, the ability to do dynamic curriculum is really hard in higher ed. So if I develop a curriculum over two years that has anything to do with technology in the world of work, it's pretty much dated by the time I'm done. Like that's an issue. Um, and then third, I think higher ed just is a fixed seat place, right? Like there are only so many seats that can be in higher ed and you have a population that's so disproportionately not going through four-year institutions. What do you do about that? For higher ed, I think the future is realizing we are moving to a world uh, where they are not the only option, but it is about options, not alternatives. So higher ed has to rethink who they are in a, in a world where there are other options like apprenticeships, like earn to learn, um, like upskilling that people need to do later in life. And I think the work for higher ed is to recognize two things. One, what is the durability of a one-off moment of education? And so I would hope we see a resurgence of interest in the humanities and some of these core general knowledge skill sets that both deliver for society what higher ed should do, which is create an informed public, but also set up future employees with a durable skill set. But then also really figuring out a way to be dynamic and adaptable to the changing needs of work. Community colleges are where I have the greatest hope because they are most incentivized to be connected to employers uh, at a local level. I just finished a great book. Um, there it is, America's Hidden Economic Engine about community colleges and some that are doing great work. Um, but it's a moment of reset. I think there is definitely a role for higher ed. Um, but I would say, again, this like unfounded elitism, one of the biggest hangups in the US is we look down on vocational training. We think that education should be in this pure form nothing about employability. It should just be about general knowledge. And we need an informed citizenry. And there is an important part to that. But we've been so dismissive of vocational training compared to countries like Germany, who really built cultural awareness and investment into things like apprenticeships, that it's coming back to hit us. And so I think we also have to be more willing to talk about employability as a reason people go get education and get to a healthier place of dialogue uh, across sectors so that we're not siloed and caricaturing each other. Um, and that, I think, is the great task for higher ed. We are just at the top of the hour. Um, I just would love if you have one final word to advice to managers who are on this call. What is one piece of advice that you would leave them with before we wrap up? I mean, I would say, you know, j just get started. Um, there is an opportunity for each and every one of you to step further into this skills first journey. Um, so don't be daunted. You don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to do it comprehensively across your whole organization. Just get started. Um, and if you have questions about that, there are lots of resources out there to help you figure out how to get started. Totally agree. And then I would add just um, not just that the story matters most, but your story of self matters most. Do the work to take a minute and say, am I wiring myself to be fearful and anxious about these moments of change? or bias towards opportunity and action. And if you're not biased towards the latter, get yourself there because the minute you're there, you'll start to see incredible opportunity for you and your teams and then what's possible for your organization and for economies writ large. And it doesn't mean that that shift solves everything for everyone, but it will solve a lot for yourself. Um, so the story of self matters most as a manager, as a leader, as an individual, but also as an organization. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Anish and Elise, for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for your great questions, as always. Next week, we'll send a link to the recording of this program, as well as a PDF of the slides. Have a fantastic rest of your day. <laughs>